God speaks to us in scripture, preaching, song, and prayer. A reading from Mark. Jesus went home, and the crowd came together again, so that Jesus and the disciples could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? Is, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Morning, church. Today we have a reading from 1 Samuel. As you can see, um, we tried to, <laughs> from the numbers, we had to edit this one to kind of give you a little bit of the big picture. Um, and because it's a longer story, because we're going to kind of dig into a story today, you could just stay seated while I read this. Hear this word of God from 1 Samuel. All the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old. And your sons do not follow in your ways. So appoint for us a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, they have rejected me from being sovereign over them. Just as they have done to me, from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so now they're also doing to you. Now, listen to them. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king that shall rule over them. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, we are determined to have a king over us so that we may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now the day before the king-to-be, Saul, came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, Tomorrow, about this time, I'll send to you a young man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall appoint him to be my ruler over Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen the suffering of my people because their outcry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul the next day, the Lord told him, Here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall rule my people. So Samuel took a vial of oil and poured it on Saul's head. He kissed him and he said, The Lord has anointed you as ruler over God's people Israel. You shall reign over the people of the Lord, and you will save them from the hand of their enemies all around. Then the prophet Samuel told Saul that he would experience several signs. He told Saul, after these signs, you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, at the place where the Philistine garrison is. There, as you come to town, you'll meet a band of prophets coming down from the shrine with harp tambourine, flute, and lyre playing in front of them, they'll be in a prophetic frenzy. Then the Spirit of the Lord will possess you, and you will be in a prophetic frenzy along with them, and you'll be turned into a different person. Now when these signs meet, with, meet you, do whatever you see fit to do, for God is with you. As he turned away to leave, God gave Saul another heart. And all these signs were fulfilled that day. 
when they were going from there to Gibeah, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God possessed him, and he fell into a prophetic frenzy along with them. When all who knew him saw how now he prophesied with the prophets, the people said to one another, what has come over Saul, the son of Kish? Is Saul now among the prophets? Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. All right, let's leave ancient Israel behind for a moment. We'll come back. It's the Iroquois County Fair in rural Crescent City, Illinois. It's mid-July, and it's hot. My family were regular summer fairgoers, but I didn't show animals. I was in 4-H, but I didn't really get it. Back then, fair food was not really an attraction, so I burned out on the rides, got bored at the fair, until I found an arcade cabinet. The cabinet was in the most random place. It wasn't in an arcade with other games. It wasn't on a midway. It was the only arcade game there, and it leaned on soft earth between the beef complex and a portable toilet. (laughs) So gross. A thick extension cord ran across the path to give it power, and the game was legendary. It was Street Fighter II, where two players dueled with martial arts pugilists. It was hardly the best arcade experience. The screen was washed out from the sun. A fine coating of dust lacquered the controls, plus hot and smelled. But I begged my parents for quarters, and I faced off against every street fighter in the county or like the six other kids that came over from the beef complex after they were done showing their animals. All right, so years later, I found a cheap copy of a different game, Virtua Fighter 4. It was the latest sequel to one of those fighting games that had just consumed my childhood imagination, and I'd heard this game was fighting game poetry, so I bought it. When I popped the game in at home, all the old memories flooded back for like five minutes. Because fighting games had evolved quite a bit in the couple decades since I had played them, and there were all these new mechanics. I had no idea what I was doing. I tried to learn, but the game had all this terminology and all these techniques I didn't understand. I was just like, press the buttons, but there was a a slow motion counter that would count the milliseconds between my button presses. I bought a book to study every single character, and I didn't get any better. Here was this whole world where players bought special controllers and drilled gameplay techniques and dedicated frame rate charts to memory. This whole world existed right under my game-loving nose, and I had no idea. I was totally out of my league. It's not the only time in my life when I've encountered an unseen world of fandom or artistry or expertise. And I'm a curious person, so I love learning about something I don't understand. But when this unseen world lurks inside something I thought belonged to me, it often makes me feel inadequate. Like how I thought I was great at fighting games and I was completely humbled by Virtua Fighter 4. So I wonder if you can remember a time when you discovered an unseen world that made you curious to learn more. But I especially wonder about a time when this new territory didn't leave you so much feeling curious as inadequate or vulnerable or small. And I want you to hold those feelings in mind as we go back to that Bible text from 1 Samuel, this really long, complex story. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start by giving you the big picture overview again. See, at this time in Israel's history, God's people had no king. For generations, they had spiritual leaders, but not political ones. They had prophets, not kings. But every other nation had a king, and God's people want one too. They have king envy. The prophet Samuel tries to tell them kings are a bad idea, but God listens to the people. God gives them a king, and God picks Saul. That's the whole first half of today's story. The people hunger for a king, and Saul is eventually uh, coronated as king. Now, this Pentecost season, we're trying to learn more about God in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit part of the story comes next. After Saul becomes king, God takes him through a series of weird encounters that culminates in a visit by the company of prophets. All right, now the Bible tells us about these companies of prophets, but they're super weird, and it doesn't give us too much information. 
These are prophet gangs, people who spoke with the Holy Spirit and also apparently sang and danced together too. You've seen this music video before. We don't really know much more about them because the Bible doesn't tell us too much more about these prophet gangs. It's just this unseen, strange world of prophets that lives right underneath everyone's nose. And God brought Saul to meet these people. Now, Saul was not a prophet, but when he met the prophets for one fiery, incredible moment, he caught the the spirit that possessed them. He got to feel what it was like to be a prophet, to have the kind of insight God gave people like Samuel and the generations of prophets and judges before them. And then just as soon as the frenzy came, it was over. He never prophesied like that again. Soon Saul would build a startup monarchy, He'd take a tribal people and transform them into a state, an international political player, even if a relatively minor one. But after his encounter with the, with the prophets and the Holy Spirit who flowed through them, Saul also knew what kind of leader he would never be. He could be a king, but he'd never be a prophet. God gave him a taste of this whole hidden, unseen world of prophecy And then God took that away. And from the day of that encounter with the prophets, Saul acted like someone who felt deeply uncomfortable with others who had power he did not possess. He acted like someone who felt inadequate. Now, I've already shared with you that I felt belittled by a video game that featured a character named Wolf Hawkfield who loved karaoke and fighting. (laughs) This is so silly. (laughs) But... And it's no big deal, right? It's a hobby. Like, I didn't lose anything when I gave up fighting games. The problem is that we often encounter experiences with unseen worlds that we can't ignore, we can't dispose of. We never want to be inadequate or feel insufficient, but sometimes we do. We hate feeling like imposters at work. It feels gross not to understand our kids' homework. As a grandparent, it can be hard to find your kids have all these ideas about parenting that you just don't understand. At church, you might think it's enough Just to say we welcome everyone, but every time you get another acronym down, like BIPOC or LGBTQIA2S+, someone adds 10 more letters. We do not like encountering people or places or experiences that make us feel insufficient and inadequate. And like Saul, we bend over backwards to hide the feelings of inadequacy we feel. That means, like Saul, who would basically tank the kingdom right after this, We often damage the people around us that we can't, because we can't admit that we need help. Like Saul, we often stretch ourselves beyond what is healthy because we have some idea that we should be able to accomplish everything. Like Saul, we often overlook help that God puts right in our path. Like Saul, we may even feel deeply ashamed because we think we should know something we don't, or we think we should be able to do something we cannot. So here's why I think this story speaks to us today. It's going to sound crazy when I say it. I believe this story shows us that a strong sense of our own inadequacy is nothing less than a gift from the Holy Spirit. It's so unusual to think this way, I'll say it again. I believe the Holy Spirit may at times actively work to show us our inadequacy, and that every time we have an encounter like this, it's a gift from God. Now, the story we heard just a couple weeks ago, the story of the first Pentecost, it shows us how this works. On Pentecost, the Holy Spirit's fire set the disciples' heads alight and gave them the superhuman ability to speak in languages they did not understand. This is the same God, the same Holy Spirit that made Saul prophesy, and all the signs are there. Those disciples experienced one flash of power, and then just like that, it was gone. Just like Saul. This experience of godly power connected those first Christians to a world they did not understand and could not understand, just like with Saul. The experience of the the first Pentecost certainly left some of them there feeling unsure and scared, a little afraid of where God was calling them, just like Saul. And just like Saul, after this one dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit, those first Christians found themselves pumping the brakes, perhaps feeling a bit inadequate by all the new discoveries and encounters they faced in the unseen worlds where God had brought them. That's right. The very same Christians who spoke with Holy Spirit fire 
those people freaked out when all the kinds of people they talked to actually started coming to church. Suddenly there were too many uncircumcised Gentiles, too many people eating food offered to idols, too many people whose families looked different, too many of those women with uncovered heads. The Holy Spirit gave them one miraculous multicultural experience, and before long there were too many new ideas, too many different cultures involved. From Pentecost forward, the stories and letters in the New Testament are they show us the Holy Spirit calling people into unseen worlds and then the people struggling to understand what to do next. At first, God's people felt the holy power. They spoke boldly to those they did not understand, but then right away they felt inadequate. But God used that inadequacy as a gift. God helped them see that the very people who once made them feel uncomfortable and uneasy were the same ones who stood by them in love and showed them God's grace. And those troublesome newcomers opened to them more than just unseen worlds of expertise or culture or ability or language. They also enabled the church to sing new beautiful songs of God's grace. They transformed a local religious movement into a global movement of purpose and love and power that gave individuals some perspective for their problems and help them see that there were people far away from them who loved them and cared for them. Every encounter with the unseen world opened Christians to new expressions for our age-old God, and on and on it went, the Holy Spirit beckoning Christians to step boldly into new places and new experiences, even ones they did not understand. Friends, the faith that we share the faith we know and love, this faith is ours only because generations of, and after generations of Christians found the courage to follow God into unseen worlds where they felt inadequate and small. And now it's our turn to take our place in this great mission of God. Now God calls us to step beyond ourselves to speak in languages we do not understand, to recover our courage, to discover unseen worlds, and to uncover our purpose as the messengers of God. If it is God's mission we purpose and God's mission we pursue, then we must expect it will feel awkward. We must expect to feel humbled. We must expect to feel inadequate and even at times unsafe because that just means we have embarked upon the mission of the God who speaks to all. The call to follow God is always and unequivocally a call to embrace our weakness, to celebrate our insufficiency, and yes, even to fall in love with our inadequacy. Because if you're going to follow God, this is a path that doesn't stop at the edge of town. If you're going to follow God, that mission will always take you someplace where you don't speak the language. Always. Crossing into the unseen world can be scary. But every once in a while, we find ourselves curiously exploring or even Holy Spirit dunk tank right into that environment we cannot know, we cannot master, we cannot even appreciate. And God does that just so we can have a little taste of the way God already loves somebody else. So we can realize that God is already at work in their lives. We don't have to speak their language, but we do have to love them. And we have to imagine that the church, that our church, can be the place where God calls all people and longs to use their gifts for God's service. And that, that, my friends, that's what it means to embrace our inadequacy. To recognize even that God might be using our inadequacy for God's higher purpose. The Holy Spirit points out everything we do not have, every experience we do not understand, and God does this so that we can take our place in the great wide mission of God. If it's true for God's church, it's also true for the inadequacy we feel in our personal lives and in our families. Even when we feel worn out and afraid, an experience with the unseen world has great rewards because God always turns our inadequacy into a gift. In our inadequacy, someone else shares their expertise. In our insufficiency, someone else uses God's gifts to help. In our ignorance, someone else has the chance to teach us their experience of God's love. 
And only then, only once we know what we lack, can we recognize how God's been longing to fill the gap. We run, like our, we run from our inadequacy like our hair's on fire, but friends, that fire's from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> it means if you want to embrace your, insuff- if you embrace your insufficiency, if you believe that it is a gift to you from God, you will experience God's presence in your life. This is what you will find. If you embrace your insufficiency, you will find that in God there is truly no such thing as inadequacy. Because the Holy Spirit knows exactly what you do not have, and the Holy Spirit knows exactly who has it. You will find in the family of God there is no such thing as inadequacy because the Holy Spirit drives us together to share both our poverty and our riches. You will find in this church there is no such thing as inadequacy because every day God gives us the courage and the strength to cross into worlds we do not understand. So my friends, embrace your weakness. Celebrate your insufficiency. Fall in love with your inadequacy. And then, only then will you find that you can never be truly inadequate because you have the strength of those around you and the love of the God who made you. Amen.